Hello, this is Jenny Clark, and today's Florida GovCon podcast is all about what I call convergence. All the things that I've seen starting to come together across the federal contracting market, I guess I would say. So let's just talk about that for a few minutes. So if I'm looking across what I would consider a regional concentration of federal contractors, I would first look at Huntsville, Alabama as probably the largest concentration. Now the state of Alabama is only like 6 million people. So even though there could be, if you include all the outer limits of Huntsville, 300,000 people in that area, there's a huge amount of people in a small area that are highly engaged in federal contracting. I'd have to say, I call it federal city. At least half the economy is tied to NASA, Marshall Space Flight Center, Redstone Arsenal, Space and Missile Defense Command, and the Missile Defense Agency up in Huntsville. Also, the Army Materiel Command, the Army Contracting Command. There's so many pieces that are there in Huntsville, and so that's why there's such a concentration of it. The only thing about Huntsville is it's hard to get in and out of. And so sometimes people think, well, you know, I'd have to spend a lot of time getting in and out of that market. So maybe I should just go to DC because every place has a direct flight to DC. So then let's talk about another area where there's a fair amount of concentration, Florida. So let's just think of all the things that are going on at the space coast between NASA and OneWeb and SpaceX and all of those activities over there. Orlando, of course, is the global epicenter of the modeling simulation and training industry. Tampa Bay is best known for the headquarters of CENTCOM Central Command and SOCOM Special Operations Command. So there's a lot of activity surrounding those plus McDill Air Force Base itself all very well known across the community. So the Space Coast, Orlando, Tampa Bay, cross I-4 in two and a half, three hours, you've got a huge belt of opportunity. All within reach, within drive time. So the next big area that I would take a look at, there's some in Georgia around Lockheed Martin, up in Atlanta, but it tends to be spread out. There's a certain amount that's around Augusta, Fort Gordon, and the other bases. Those are support activities or operational support activities related to what those bases functions are doing. And I believe Augusta now has um, Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity. Why are these things moving down to these different areas? Because there have always been a lot of military bases in the South. The South tends to have more people serving in the military, and it's just starting to be a better place to try to locate some of these other industries or the concentration of federal work, because it happens to be a fair amount cheaper to live in the South, in my opinion. Um, let's then talk about South Carolina. The biggest place in South Carolina for this is obviously Charleston. And there's a huge concentration of contractors around Charleston related to um, Spay War and other activities. Then North Carolina, all the actions around Fort Bragg. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to drive from Tampa to Fort Bragg to try to do business, but if you start to take a look around, you'll recognize that a lot of people are already traveling back and forth anyway. Not that you can't meet them in D.C., but my recommendation is figure out what you can do in a more concentrated area, so you're not spending days and days in travel, in transit, in traffic, and waiting for meetings, standing in line with 3,000 other people to try to get to one person. Let's try to take a more focused, more research-based approach. That's what I'm calling the network. Another thing I wanted to mention is that the focus really needs to be looking at what are the growth trends that we're facing. If I think back to when I had my first bag phone, how huge that was, or my first calculator, and what we have today, we know this is gonna speed up, and I'm not sure I'm entirely in favor of that. Take me two weeks to get my internet back online, and I still barely know how to change the channels, so maybe this isn't gonna be me 
But if I'm looking at trends, one of the books that I've re read recently is called Growth Trends, and it's called Industries of the Future by Alex Ross, who served in the Obama administration or with them in some capacity, because he mentions Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in a number of areas. Nonetheless, he gave a very good definition of the trends that he had identified with good citations about where they were coming from. There were some wonderful examples. He, I think he came up with six different industries of the futures, but the one that I picked up on were the top five that he listed. Cybersecurity, obviously, we know that's gonna to continue to grow because every device we have is being collect, connected electronically, which means there's lots of places that that can be intercepted electronically. Robotics, obviously, is gonna make a big difference. Every time I go into Target, they're taking away some more cashiers and making me stand in line and do self-serve. It's really funny because I think it's Oregon that just now has um, pump your own gas recently. And um, it was a big complaint up there. There were a lot of radio, there was a lot of stuff on the web about people complaining about that. So I guess just like I got used to pumping my own gas, I'll get used to checking out my own groceries. But really what I expect to happen is not too far in the future. They'll just have it so that everything has an RFID chip embedded and they'll know as you cross over the threshold how much to charge, it'll automatically charge the credit card chip that's embedded in your arm. So robotics is a big thing. Obviously, we are creating machines that will take the functions of people. However, those people can be used for um, more analytical things, more thought, more creativity, more inspiration. And we're gonna find a way for all of this to be a growth for everybody. Next big thing is big data analytics. And I know they call it a lot of different things, but if you think about it, think about how many more transactions are going on all the time. Um, we're interacting all the time. I don't know about you, but right now I've got um, two computers right next to me, one in the other room. I've got my cell phone, my backup cell phone, my iPad, my TV sets, my Alexis, and I have an, ex an, an Echo Show. I have an Echo Dot, I have another Echo Dot. Sometimes they get into arguments, by the way. I'll be talking to one and the other one will hear something and try to interpret what I'm doing. I just changed my internet. Um, it was called some funky name and I had it changed to solvability. And once I did that, I realized I had to reconnect all my devices. Well, some of the devices are these things I call Jimboo smart plugs. And now I've got to go reset all of those. So I'm really upset because I haven't gotten them reset. I can't turn my lights on and off by telling Alexa to do it yet. So everybody, if you think about it, I'm just a one person that lives in 1300 square foot condo and I've got 18 devices and that doesn't seem like a lot to me. So multiply that by all of the people and everything you've got. And obviously there's gonna be a lot of data to be analyzing. The other thing is we wanna be able to have this analysis done over multiple languages, over multiple formats, um, pulling it from all kinds of places. So the more data we collect, the more analysis is required and the more depth. And of course that comes into machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, and all of those related fields. Cryptocurrencies is another big piece. Obviously it's Bitcoin and the other, but one of the predictions is that it's going to create opportunities for the shifts of the economic capital. Because if the central banks no longer control the money supply, then who does and how? And Estonia, oddly enough, is one of the countries that is um, making a lot of inroads into this. And I think it's because I, they got hacked at some point, so they're really learning what they can do. Think about how many underdeveloped countries skipped over phone lines and went straight to cell phones. So, Things are shifting quickly, and we've got to be taking a look at where that creates opportunities. The last section is about geno genomics, and that's because the hu human genome was um, basically, what do they call it, in unencrypted? Um, it was interpreted, and there's a lot more information out there, so that gives more opportunities for people to really figure out what the genetic components are, how to treat it, what to do so that you can get very specific about creating a, treatments for specific things and learning how to 
use medicine more highly customized. So what does that mean for companies that might be involved in federal contracting? Well, we know that Orlando is the center of modeling, simulation, and training, but when I was there for ITSIC at the end of November, first part of December 2017, as usual, I saw people that I knew from all over, because there's a lot of this activity coming from Huntsville, Alabama, obviously the DC market. It's global, and it's only gonna keep increasing because you've got a lot more capability when you can automate or uh, create imagery or explain it visually or um, use um, simulators to repeat things than you do if you have to try to train people individually and train them one-on-one -on -one. in small groups. It's a lot faster to deliver the information. But the other thing that simulation and training does is let us try a lot of different scenarios faster and really make a lot of progress. And of course, it goes all the way across what started in modeling simulation and training, maybe with, let's think of airplane simulators, is now available from a lot of different usages, and that's only gonna grow. Soft technologies, and by that we mean special operations forces, technologies. These are more specialized all the time, and of course, if there's equipment they can use, if there are tools they can use, if there's um, commercial off the shelf things, it could be rapidly adapted. Um, quickly responding, small quantities, those things are really gonna have a big change in how we do it. The other thing we're gonna see is more interoperability and more ways that people can take parts that previously didn't go together and find ways to connect them up and hook them up. So the response time, the rap rapidity of how quickly we need to be able to respond in order to address threat has to be sped up. Imagery and analysis. As we're using these tools of simulation or gathering data electronically or uploading things to a drone and needing to process it quickly on site instead of transmitting it back down to a base for it to be interpreted the next day by analysts, trying to find some way that we can speed up that process. All of these are opportunities for growth industries and for innovators to be involved. Translation and integration. Um, it would be a lot easier if everybody in the world spoke English, but we're soon going to be all speaking Chinese or the various dialects, and there is no such language as Pakistani. There are so many different variations of languages and dialects that are really encountering each other more than they used to. Part of what needs to happen is to be able to gather that information, translate it so it can be used for whatever um, security purposes that need to be used for. Cartography is another big area. If you think about how wonderful it is that you don't have to have a paper map anymore, unless you're like me, and I really just wanna have a giant map on my wall so I can figure out where I'm going before I get in the car. Because when I start driving, I can only see that little teeny piece of what's showing up on my display, and that's not really enough. I need more lead time to know whether I'm gonna have to turn left or right. And I guess it's just me not being able to, do, to adapt as quickly as I would like to be. Transmission speeds are gonna be really, really important, and that ties it back in to cybersecurity. How do you um, send data faster? How do you send it more securely? How do you get it um, there wirelessly? What are your options and, and how to do that? So we're gonna see a lot of change. And that also relates to a certain extent to power supplies because everything we're doing requires more energy. And because of that, batteries need to continue to get smaller and more powerful. And that's really one of the most critical elements that'll be important as we go forward into the future. Recognition could be uh, voice recognition, it could be uh, facial recognition, all types of things. And it could be something more um, like if you're sending a drone up to do an overview or an overflight of a particular area, sometimes you just need to be able to point out shapes or movement. Other times you need to be able to uh, read the insignia on the shoulder of a soldier. So those are gonna be very important to figure out what level of precision you need to do, how, how close do you need to go, how far away do you need to go, does it just need to be generic? Unmanned systems aren't just the little drones that you buy for your kids that they can take pictures and, um, and play with. It's 
going, it's un, uh, it's obviously there are unmanned vehicles or autonomous vehicles that pretty soon by the time I'm in a nursing home, I will just be able to call the, the car and have it take me around so I won't have to worry about whether I'm going to lose my driver's license because I won't be driving. It'll be great. Um, there's also, if you think about it, um, underwater activity. There are drones that are used in agriculture. That's only going to grow. Um, I'm expecting that Amazon, who now can deliver things to me, usually the next day, almost the day before. I think one day they'll be able to deliver it the day before I need it. So um, all of those things are going to continue to grow. And they're great opportunities for companies that are started in this area. But we've got to fit, find some ways to really collaborate because you can't do any of these disciplines without having pieces of the other disciplines. You can't put a drone up in the air without knowing from cartography and geographic information systems where you need it to go. You can't have soft technologies and imagery and analysis without taking into account the speed of the transmission, how you're going to translate it and integrate it, and what kind of image really, what kind of detail um, do you need to have to do it. And cybersecurity, of course, is across all of these areas because security is part of it, but making sure that the data is secure and where you're going to store it, how you're going to do it. These are all things we need to be taking a look at. So we're also going to be talking at the Florida GovCon Summit about um, some of these technologies that go across um, multiple areas, multiple regions and how we're going to do it. But what we're really talking about these days is acquisition is going to change from the old platform where it's proprietary and I want to build this so I can control it and large companies um, have the power because they um, basically control the intellectual property to where because we've got to respond faster, um, fail faster, move faster, large companies are going to be able to do that effectively, but small and nimble federal contractors will be. And so the, t the trend is going to go away from these big, large RFP pieces, especially in the soft world, in the, in the um, simulation and technology to where you have small prototypes, they're rapidly developed. You go one direction, we fail. Okay, let's start back over there. Let's go over here. Let's test 12 things at once instead of 17. Now, I, I should tell you that many years ago when I was in college, my dad didn't want me to go very far. He was kind enough to provide a car for me, but it was a Peugeot. And we had a series of Peugeots. At one point, I took a picture of the five old cars they had in the garage that were Peugeot's. They were all in the garage, of course, because we didn't have that big of a garage. But when he came back from Vietnam, he was just convinced that these Peugeot's could run forever. And they could if you had parts. Anyway, I could fix that thing. I could start it with a screwdriver. I could do all kinds of things because I had to learn how to do that in order to survive. So what I'm saying is one of the things he told me to do is never change more than one part at one time because if you do that, you don't know which one fixed the problem. Well, in today's world, we need to be able to have multiple ways to test things from different angles and having more small businesses go after changes using challenge grants and some of the things that they're really experimenting these days with at Softworks and um, some of the other innovation labs creates great opportunity for small business that wasn't there before. Now, I do want to say, I'm not in favor of saying, let's all show up for pizza and beer and try to figure these things out. But if you could create an open environment where people are willing to share, we learn faster working with other people. I'd much rather be in a room with um, 10 other people where we're throwing out IDs trying to solve it because we can solve something a lot faster if we're willing to be open about it. If we're back in the old, okay, well, here's the contract. Here's how we're going to do it. Don't ask that person. Um, you're not supposed to be doing that. That's not the path we're going down. We don't need to go after those big things when their opportunities are for the smaller ones. So what we're really seeing is we need to be taking a look at how we accelerate second stage small business. That's a multiplier in our economy. Why is that? Okay, it takes a lot for a small business to get from zero to three years. A lot of those fail. But if you can get past that point, a company that's gotten past that point has more likelihood of being able to 
succeed and hire more people, spin off other companies, pr protect our economy, create new opportunities. So let's accelerate our second stage small businesses. And this is something that Grow FL has been concentrating on, has done a very good job in making those opportunities available and celebrating those companies that have done that. Let's do something similar through the Florida GovCon Summit and other communities, uh, other community programs that really support this. Let's tie them all together instead of each one trying to do their own thing. There's ways that we can do it. So what we're really looking for, I'm looking for out of the Florida GovCon Summit is how can we use our federal contracting dollars, our federal contracting base to create more economic advantage across the entire state of Florida? So growing up, uh, my dad was in the Navy, but we did end up in Pensacola and I was there for the most part from fifth grade on, went off to college, went to graduate school, came back, I'm back in Pensacola and okay, do you wanna be a travel agent? Do you wanna sell condos in Destin? What do you wanna do? Florida has always been this tourist service economy, a lot of real estate overshadowing the technology that we have that's developing here. So let's get this together, let's play it up, let's expand it, let's generate something off of that. The other thing that we've got a real benefit for is the access to the veteran workforce that has extensive training and leadership. So what we're really looking for is how do we make all this come together and what we, can we do? So those are some of the challenges of economic development. There's a lot of people working for it, on it. I mean, Florida has 20 million people. So um, there's a lot of different interests. And it's almost funny to me, recognizing niches within niches. Um, people say, well, your niche is federal contract. I don't think it is a niche. It's too big to be a niche. But when you talk about soft technology or uh, modeling a sim or whatever, those are niches, but they really aren't because it depends on what agency you're working for, or are you working for a DOD or are you working for NASA? There's so much room in here. Where do we find the commonality to strengthen this uh, federal contracting community? So Florida GovCon Summit is to bring together small businesses in federal contracting, the entrepreneurs, the business developers, um, the people that are helping to run the operations, to help them understand better what some options are, how they could work together, what they can do to make it work. Now, I can't teach somebody how to win a, a government contract, and I've never won one. I don't know how to do all these things. I've seen the practices, but I admire so much the people that are willing to do it. But what we're really talking about is if we could help small business improve the return on investment for the bid and proposal dollar, even by 5%. That's gonna make more jobs across our community. If we can make it so that um, small businesses have a higher probability of win because they're better prepared by knowing what they go after, good for the economy, good for jobs, good for the entrepreneur that wants to build more and spin off more. What about teaming? What if you found out that the people you need to know to get on your next team are close by or they know somebody or there's a way to do it. So often I feel like we as small business owners, we have our head down focused on just two or three things and we can't look around. And so what I'm trying to do is work with people to, ident to create a venue, create a way that people can collaborate all the way across the community because there's so many talented people here. So, the Florida GovCon Summit is about collaboration. It's about describing risk and figuring out how to manage it. It's about vision and how we support each other in what we're thinking about. It's about state leadership, making sure that our legislature and our um, executive branch understands how important this federal business is to the economy and what more can be done with it and how many jobs it could support, how many jobs it could generate especially when you think of the adaptability of some of this technology development to dual use technology, the things that are going on in um, aerospace for military are gonna be adaptable for the aerospace industry or for NASA. 
big issue is the access for funding and for growth. Now, you know, nobody can afford just to help everybody start a business and bootstrap and, or here, let me give you some money and you go try this. We're not really set up that way, but there are alternatives that we could develop to find ways that we can get access to funding for growth and to choose among the product projects that are valuable to fund because they've got a higher probability to succeed. But in order for that to work, we've got to create more opportunities for collaboration and figure out how to do it. I've always told people that federal contracting currently is not about um, selling your product to the government. It's about finding a way that they can buy. So the question is, what are the needs and how do you get, how do you find the people that have the needs and how you can, how you can solve those issues. And with um, Softworks in Tampa Bay, with um, the new one that's opening up in Orlando T-Rex, um, the NSXTL, um, which is a, an, an other transaction authority consortium. There are great opportunities and I'm hoping that we can talk about those things at the Florida GovCon Summit and learn from each other and really start some momentum going across um, all the way across the state. And it's not that it hasn't been going on, um, but I just feel like there's more opportunity that we could discover together. So I'm hoping that I'll see you at the Florida GovCon Summit. It's February 28th, March 1st, 2018 in Orlando. It's gonna be at the ballroom at, at Church Street, which is 10,000 square feet. That's triple of the size of what we did in Tampa last year. And so I've got it all. I've got the ballroom booked. I've got um, speakers lined up. I've got a great set of sponsors that are working with me on this. We'll have the, the Florida GovCon Summit has concurrent tracks and then some matchmaking and other activities going on as well. And then we also have the Veteran Connections track where I will be bringing through 100 transitioning veterans. Some will be job seekers, some of them will be veteran entrepreneurs, startups that are looking to um, be connected with the community, um, mostly of federal veterans or for, uh, of, of veterans that have been through that process that knows what are, know what it's like and are wanting to support them in that. So um, again, this is Jenny Clark with the Florida GovCon Summit, and I'm hoping to see you there next month.